Okay. Okay. All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. We'll uh, we'll get started. Um, so today is building the wine lab. I am Aaron Essery, Assistant Extension Specialist for Viticulture and Enology here at Oklahoma State University. Uh, and this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, man, that's just a little, little fun gift there. Um, so building a wine lab. Um, I have some ideas of how, well, let me just say wine labs can be all kinds, shapes, sizes. Um, let's focus on the picture to the right for a minute. As you can see, that's a, that's a wine lab right there. That's about four feet of space and it's just on a bench top. Um, and I can go through and kind of tell you and see what's, what's all there. Um, to the list on the left, if I were to build a wine lab, which I mean, I, I have before, but um, if I was starting from nothing, the first thing I would get is a Vinmetrica SC300. That is a nifty little piece of equipment, which I will cover uh, a couple of times in this presentation. It, um, the Vinmetrica SC300 will measure pH, titratable acidity, and free SO2 all together in one unit. And it's, it's really, really handy. So that is the first piece of equipment I would buy. After that, I would just start accumulating various glassware, you know, beakers, pipettes, um, Erlenmeyer flasks, all, any and all kinds of just chemistry glassware. You just slowly accumulate and accumulate and you figure out what you need. Um, with that, stands and clamps, because you have to clamp the glassware to something and to each other. So stands and clamps are important. Something that's often overlooked is a functioning sink. If you're, if you're gonna build a wine lab or implement a wine lab, it needs to be close to a sink, uh, especially when you start measuring uh, volatile acidity and bound SO2, but then also just have a place to dump you and clean your glassware. So you need a sink. Uh, with that, you also need a uh, flame source or some type of controlled heat. Again, that's for bound SO2 and VA, um, but it comes in handy. A scale never hurts, a dishwasher never hurts, a drying rack for the glassware, because once you wash them, you need to dry them, uh, paper towels or Kim wipes, um, and then a squirt bottle with distilled water um, are often overlooked, but also important. So back to the picture on the right. So if you look up at the very top, you see those little pear-shaped flasks and the tubes and hoses all connected. That's free SO2, and it looks like they have two contraptions set up. Um, if you follow the brown rubber hoses, that if you follow them down back and it looks like they have to be connected to a sink somewhere because those rubber hoses carry water. And I can see that if they're measuring free SO2, if they have water connected to it, then they're measuring bound SO2 as well. Um, if you look down to that black box, that just looks like a pH meter, but it also could double as a dissolved oxygen meter. I'd have to look at that more closely. Um, to the far left, kind of out of frame is a scale. I mean, that helps, never hurts to, never hurts to not have one. Uh, little paper towels or Kim wipes, they're just, you know, for cleaning up spills and messes. You can see those two long burettes that are connected to a clamp and a stand that's likely for measuring TA. Um, in the foreground to the left, an Erlenmeyer flask, always helpful. A squirt bottle there in the very front. To the right is like a um, graduated cylinder for measuring. Uh, and then you can see kind of on the back right are different pipettes and, you know, things like that. So, so there I can see free SO2, bound SO2, pH, TA, likely dissolved oxygen. Um, and if there's a sink to the left, there, there's probably a volatile acidity or a cash still set up out of frame. Uh, so right there is like a fully functioning wine, wine lab and it's, you know, just in four feet of space. So you can set these up in a compact, uh, compact setting. Uh, but it's always important to have a sink close. All right, so we'll we'll run through all this. Um, just some terminology for those who don't know. Uh, beakers, Erlenmeyer flask, boiling flask, graduated cylinders, burettes, uh, pipettes. These are all all important. The only thing I've never used in this picture for winemaking is a bell jar, uh, yeah. a crystallings dish, and a separatory funnel. Everything else in this picture I've used or have implemented in some, so in some sort of way uh, for a wine lab. You can buy various assorted glasswares off Amazon for like $200 and it just comes with, I mean, it's like a, it's a chemistry set really, uh, but it, it, it just covers 
a, a wide spectrum of all these and, and they're important. And once you get just an assorted set, you then figure out like, oh, I need an elbow or I need this or I need that. And you can pick up, you know, one or two pieces to, to, to really build your lab. So <clears throat> fundamental measurements. And in my mind, there are five fundamental measurements when it comes to measuring uh, your wine. pH and titratable acidity, free SO2 are extremely important. Volatile acidity is important as well, and alcohol percentage. And I'll, I'll cover all of these uh, today. So pH, uh, also known as potential hydrogen. pH is the measurement of free hydrogen ions in solution. And the pH scale is logarithmic, it's, it's tenfold. So if you start at seven, which is considered neutral, a pH of six has 10 more hydrogen ions than a pH of seven. The pH of five has 10 more hydrogen ion, has 10 times more hydrogen ions than pH of six, and so on and so forth. So you can see that's what it means to measure pH. You're measuring the potential of hydrogen in solution. Uh, wine is between three and four, so it's, a, it's acidic. Um, and then as you get above seven, you get basic, which is like fractions of hydrogen, theoretically. Um, so, you know, closer to one, the more acidic you are, closer to 14, the more basic you are. The color of wine is dependent on pH. Not a lot of people know that. Um, it's not a drastic change, but it is a, a hue. You can go from like a bright pink red, which is closer to three, to like a duller, more brick, more ruby, I guess, maybe purple, as you get closer to four. Uh, it will turn blue eventually, but you have to have like a pH of six or something. But so color is dependent on pH. And down at the bottom are just some textbook numbers. Uh, wine pH of whites should be 3.1 to 3.4 and red wine pH 3.4 to 3.8. Uh, those are safe, safe ranges. So all you, need to measure, all you need to measure pH is just a good, reliable pH meter. Uh, again, a Venmetrica, which measures pH, TA, and free SO2 is the top left uh, picture there. Um, I've seen and then used uh, Exotech pH meters, which are the pen type, you just drop into solution and it measures pH, you know, those, those work well. Uh, and then you can have those fancy bench top pH meters with the retractable arm. Um, Fry's Tendon is a, is a brand and those good. As long as it holds a calibration, any pH meter is fine. So pH is simple. Titratable acidity. So TA is the measurement of organic acid content whether it be tartaric acid, malic acid, citric acid, even acetic acid is an organic acid and, and contributes to TA. It's usually expressed in grams per liter. And again, textbook ranges uh, for TA in wine, red wine would be four to six grams a liter, white wine is 5.5 to 8.0 uh, grams a liter. So equipment to measure TA using glassware. You just need an Erlenmeyer flask, a burette, and a uh, ring stand and clamps to hold it all. And all you do is titrate. Um, you do need chemicals, chemical reagents for that. 0 0.1 molarity of sodium hydroxide and something called phenethylene, which is just an indicator solution uh, to help change color. So when you go to measure titratable acidity, the phenethylene is used as a color change indicator. Um, well, first you would start with 10 milliliters of wine, which you would measure using a pipette or a graduated cylinder, 30 milliliters of water measured using a beaker or graduated cylinder, put them together in the Erlenmeyer flask, add two drops of phenethylene, and then you just titrate with that 0 0.1 normality of uh, sodium hydroxide. Now, that phenethylene is used as a color change indicator. As you can see, it starts out colorless, and as you get more and more basic, it turns pinker and pinker and then to a hot pink. Uh, what's important to know is that this is actually your endpoint when measuring TA. If you've got a pink that's that bright, that's over titrated, you've gone too much. And I've highlighted uh, down there, you can see the first permanent peak indicator is the endpoint. As you titrate wine, which is acidic, as you titrate wine with a base, you're making it more basic. The, you'll, the phenethylene, it, it turns pink and it drops, but then it, it disappears because your, your solution is still acidic. As you, as you hit about an 8, 8.2 pH, it'll persist pink. And that's your, that's your end point. If you go higher, it's more basic, it's, it's too far. Um, and then 
the calculation, you just take the amount of volume you used in your, your red, multiply it by 0 0.75, and that gives you your TA. TA is really not hard. And if you if you kind of wanted to dabble and I want to do some wine chemistry, start with TA. It's it's extremely important. You, you take your wine and you titrate it with a base, it, it, just like that. Or you can just buy a Venmetrica SC300, which is a phenomenal piece of equipment and it measures TA just as well. You still have to titrate, but it it's very, very simple. Um, again, if, if you're trying to build a wine lab, this is the first piece of equipment I would start with. It is awesome. Okay, free sulfur dioxide or free SO2 is the measurement of free sulfur dioxide in wine. Potassium metabisulfite um, is added to increase free SO2 levels. That's what you measure when you measure free SO2. Um, free SO2 protects against oxidation and microbial spoilage. And then also more just textbook ranges um, for free SO2 in wine is 15 to 40 parts per million. And that just kind of depends on you and your, your style and how you like it. Some people like to run high free SO2 levels because they're, I don't ever want it to be oxidized or spoiled. And some people run very low free SO2 levels because they say, well, I don't want a whole lot of sulfur in my wine. There's no wrong or right answer. It's just you and your wine making, white making techniques. Um, but these ranges I would recommend. So free SO2 is a little bit cumbersome, but once you learn how to do it, you will wonder why you never learned it sooner. Um, it is a absolutely critical measurement. And if you're making wine, I mean, either commercially or, or as a hobby, you need to be able to check your free SO2 levels anytime, any time of the year. Um, it's a bit daunting, but once you learn it, it's phenomenal. And it just takes repetition. It's just do it and do it and do it. And then you'll, like I say, wonder why you, you never learned it sooner. So the equipment needed, uh, a 250 milliliter round bottom flask, has to be multi-port, it has to have multiple necks. It can't be one neck. It has to have two, three is fine if you have a stopper, but you need at least two. You need a pear-shaped flask. You need something called a vacuum takeoff adapter. Um, and then you need a hollow glass tube and an inlet, which I'll get to. Again, you need elbows and connectors, ring stands, pipettes, beakers. And then one goofy piece of equipment, but it's actually crucial. Uh, you need what's you need an, an aquarium fish pump. Uh, a vacuum pump works way better, uh, but a vacuum pump also costs hundreds or thousands of dollars. An aquarium fish pump costs like eight bucks, um, and it works just the same. Um, it, it it does. It's it's just as good. Chemicals needed: uh, hydrogen peroxide. Now you can buy household hydrogen peroxide from Walgreens or Walmart regular. H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, it just needs to be diluted down to 0.3%. So when you buy it off the store shelf at Walmart, it's at 3%. You have to dilute it down with water to 0.3%. And that's a one and nine part ratio. One part hydrogen peroxide, nine parts water will give you 0.3% H2O2. And that's a chemical you need for this, uh, for this test. You need sulfuric acid, you need phosphoric acid, I'm sorry. You need 25% phosphoric acid, you need 0.01 normality in AUH. Uh, there is a difference. Be careful on your concentration because you need 0.01 normality. And then you need free SO2 indicator. What's cool about these chemicals is you can buy them all off Amazon and have them shipped to your door. I've done it. It's, it's simple. So just getting the equipment, setting it up, and then learning how to do it, and then do it again, do it again, do it again. And it's going to be one of the best tests you've ever learned to do. So the equipment for a uh, move this way. Equipment for uh, free SO2. Let's start at the very top right with the multi-port flask. That's pretty much what you need. You need a round bottom or flat bottom. Uh, probably no round bottom. I would say you need a round bottom multi-port flask. Has to be at least two ports. You need a pear-shaped flask, which is that heart-looking flask to the left. Now. You need something called a vacuum takeoff adapter, and that's that's for airflow. Just continuing to the left, you you see how the elbow and the vacuum takeoff adapter both have their their nipple. You have to have either matching elbows and vacuum takeoff adapters, or if you look to the bottom right, you can see how those elbows and vacuum takeoff adapters are conical; they slide into one another. Either one is fine. You just need to match, 
And I put that in yellow. Make sure all your fittings match. 2240 is standard. 2240 is a measurement of glassware. Uh, there's like, there's 1420, there's 2440. Doesn't matter as long as they all match. And then that, that the uh, vacuum takeoff adapter and the elbow have to work together. So where, at, whether you're using a, a conical pieces that slide together or you're using like nipple pieces that you can connect with a hose, doesn't matter, they just have to match. If you're gonna use the conical pieces that slide together, you'll have to use a condenser, which is, is fine. And in fact, a condenser is great because once you learn free SO2, you can then measure bound SO2, which is advanced, but never hurts. Um, and then you need this little thermometer inlet adapter and a hollow tube. That thermometer inlet adapter goes into one of the ports on the multi-port flask, but instead of putting a thermometer in there, you're going to put a hollow tube in there. And that hollow tube is going to connect to a, that aeration fish pump to push air through. And that once you set it up correctly, there's air flowing through the whole contraption. And it's, it's the best way to measure free SO2, in my opinion. Um, and it's very, very precise. So all this connected together looks something like that. Uh, this is my personal uh, rig that I made uh, because I, I just like this stuff so much. I'm not even kidding. This is mine set up in my house. Uh, and they take on many variations. Some can be vertical. Some can be horizontal. This one's horizontal. But you see how my elbow and my vacuum takeoff adapter are nipple. So I just have a piece of rubber hose connecting the two. And that's totally fine. It works. It's it's not good to measure bound SO2 like that, but for free SO2, that's totally great. Um, and you can see how all the pieces fit. You have your adapter with a glass hollow tube running through it, connected to your hose, connected to your fish pump, which pushes air through. It bubbles the wine acid solution, pushes the liberated free SO2 through the elbow, through the hose, through the vacuum takeoff adapter, and gets captured in that pear-shaped flask. That pear-shaped flask is what you titrate with a base to get your free SO2 levels. Um, I, I, it's, it's really complicated to explain the processes. Well, I, I have to demonstrate this in person or like personally through Zoom to show you how to use it. But if you ever get to this point where it's set up and it's like, hey, I have this free SO2 rig, how do I measure free SO2? Please call me or contact me and I'll walk you through how much wine you need, how much phosphoric acid you need, the, the H2O2. But if you get to this point, I just wanted to show, this is how you set up a free SO2 rig and it's crucial. Of course, I have stands and clamps to hold everything together. Don't forget that. Um, and it, it's very, 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 very good measurement to know, very good test to know how to, how to measure your free SO2 and wine. Now, with all that being said, or you can just buy a Venmetrica SC300 that measures free SO2 as well. Again, phenomenal piece of equipment, especially if you have nothing. If you're making wine and you're like, I have no laboratory equipment, just buy an SC300. Accumulate the glassware over time, but this little device uh, measures free SO2 and it's awesome. Uh, it works well. I've used one before and I really, really like them. So if you're, if you're not into chemistry and it's just way over your head and it's too daunting, Stick with this piece of equipment because it'll give you pH, it'll give you TA, it'll give you free SO2, and that's that's three parts of your lab right there. Um, and it's very, you know, saves a lot of space. So be good. I'll check. Uh, there's a chat. I'll check it at the end. I'll check it out. Oh, what is the cost of it in Metrica? Um, about $600 landed. So to get it delivered to your door would cost about $600. But there, I'm not. I'm not sure if you're going to cover that. But there's also uh, an extra attachment you can get that will measure dissolved oxygen, and I understand now that they've got an extra attachment that will measure residual sugar as well. Okay. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're uh, Venmetrica is a good, good brand, good piece of equipment, and if they're coming out with all that attachments, that's that's incredible. I think I've heard Yan too. I think they're trying to make an attachment for YAN, which is yeast assimilable nitrogen, which is good for, for measuring a crush. Good to know. Watch out. Yes, YAN too. Nice. Um, volatile acidity, let's, let's move forward. Um, so VA is the measurement of wine's volatile acids, specifically acetic acid and ethyl acetate. 
Um, VA is usually expressed in grams per liter. Uh, any wine with a VA above 1.0 is in danger of spoiling. Um, and 1.0 grams per liter is still is pretty high. That's that's pretty it's detectable. Um, recommended ranges for VA and wine 0.2 to 0.8. Of course, less is always better, but it's been debated debated that 0.0, .0 grams a liter will mute aromas because nothing's volatile. I don't know how true that is, um, but a little VA is said to help. Um, of course, all wine is made with some some sort of VA, some you know level of VA. White wines toler tolerate less VA than red uh, because red wines have a lot more phenolics and color and tannins, and they can they can hold. I guess what am I trying to say? White wine is more delicate, and so VA is more easily detected in, in white wine. So on to the measurement. Equipment needed for VA. Well, there's something called a cash steel, uh, which is specifically for measuring volatile acidity in wine. Uh, you need various flasks, burettes, pipettes, and a ring stand to hold it all. Or you can buy a distillation kit off of Amazon. Um, if you buy a distillation kit, you'll need a flame source for boiling, whether it be a, a Bunsen burner or a butane burner, or maybe a just really extremely hot, hot plate but you still need various flasks and burettes and, and pipettes. Uh, and then of course, a ring stand to hold everything. Chemicals needed, 0.1, 0 0.01 normality, sodium hydroxide, um, and then phenethylene indicator uh, for that color change as well. On these, on these sodium hydroxides, note the different concentrations. There's a difference between 0 0.1 and 0 0.01, um, and different concentrations are needed for different tests. So, for your VA measurements, on the left is a cash steel. Runs about $900, um, but they're nice and they're fancy and they're all in one unit. Um, I think they're made to order. They're, they're custom blown or glass blown. I, I, maybe they're made to order, I'm not sure, but they're, they're pretty specific. Um, but the good thing about a cash steel is that you can run multiple tests back to back without ever having to let the machine cool down. Um, it has a built-in heating coil, so you don't need an external flame source. You can just plug the cash still, cash still into an outlet, turn it on, and it, it boils wine, um, condenses the vapor, you catch your distillate, and you just titrate like that. If you're going the cheaper route, which is a standard distillation kit, um, this will work too. I've used both, and both, both work fine. Uh, but with the distillation kit, it's a bit more cumbersome because you have to let the machine cool down between uses. Yeah. And, and then you also have to have an external flame source. So you, if you have to buy like a Bunsen burner or a butane burner, you have to have some way to boil wine. Um, the cash deal is nice if you have a lot of samples to run, you got a full-fledged lab. But if you're only like testing VA once or twice or three times a year, a, a distillation kit will, will work just fine too. How it works though is that big round bottom flask uh, holds the wine, you boil it, the volatile acidity, the ethyl acetate, the acetic acid, volatilize. They, they become vapor. That vapor then travels up the column, gets condensed back to a liquid through the condenser, and then is captured uh, at the end. That captured vapor is then titrated to tell you your, your VA levels. Um, that's called the distillate. And it's you're distilling the wine, essentially, um, but for volatile acidity purposes. So like I, like I was just saying, explaining. Uh, Boiling, the wine releases the volatile acids as a vapor. This vapor is then condensed back into a liquid and captured. Uh, the captured liquid, called the distillate, is then titrated using NaOH to reveal the amount of volatile acidity present. So to measure VA, you collect 100 mils of distillate, add two drops of phenethylene into uh, your beaker or your flask, and then titrate it using NaOH. You just take your calculations, the volume you use, multiply it by 0.06, and that gives you VA. Um, I know I'm not running through the whole process of how to do it, but you know the equipment you need and, and the gist of doing it, uh, that's it. And it's good to measure VA. Alcohol percentage. So this is one that is, I don't know of another way to measure alcohol accurately without an ebulliometer. Um, ebulliometry is a French word, I believe, uh, or European at least, I think it's French. 
Um, but it measures ethanol, alcohol, and, uh, and solution by volume. You need an ebulliometry, an ebulliometer to measure alcohol. This is a very specific piece of equipment. To the left is a digital ebulliometer. To the right is a classic uh, analog ebulliometer. I've used both. Um, the one on the left is you just plug it in, put the wine in, turn it on, and it measures alcohol you know, digitally. I think it still heats up and, and boils, um, but it gives you a, a digital reading output, tells you, you know, 13%, 12%. The one on the right is a classical ebulliometry. And um, I own one of these as well, personally. I, I like it. Um, you have to calibrate it using water. And then once it's calibrated, you then just boil, you pour wine in, boil the wine, and that thermometer will tell you the boiling point of wine. Uh, the boiling point of ethanol alcohol is always lower than water. So whatever your boiling point of alcohol is, you measure it against your calibration. Again, you, you need one of these to measure alcohol. Um, I don't know of a way, a good way to measure alcohol without it. Um, there are big fancy computerized, you know, pieces of equipment that measure alcohol, but I, I, this is my favorite way at least, and I don't know of another good way. So if you're trying to measure alcohol, you just need to invest in ebulliometer. They, they're, they can be expensive, maybe about a thousand dollars or so. Maybe you can find a good used one for a few hundred, uh, but classical ebulliometry um, or digital ebulliometry is the way to go, in my opinion. So that was the main five, uh, the big five, as I call them, fundamental measurements. If you are, if you're one of those that I can do all that, like I have a wine lab and I can measure four or five of those measurements and I'm, I want to measure some other stuff, great. Um, yeast assimilable nitrogen is the next one, which uh, according to the chat, uh, the Venmetrica measures YAN too. So invest in a in Venmetrica SC300 and you have like four or five tests covered already. Uh, Venmetrica is a great piece of equipment. So uh, yeast assimilable nitrogen is good to measure at crush because that will tell you how much um, nitrogen your yeast have to feast on. Um, dissolved oxygen is a good one to measure, especially when you're bottling or you know when, you're, when your wine is still and it's in tank and you're moving it from tank to tank or barrel to barrel. And it's like, let me just check the dissolved oxygen real fast. You need a specific meter for that. It's kind of like a pH meter, but it's a dissolved oxygen meter. You know, It's just one little piece of equipment. Bound SO2 and total SO2. Once you've mastered free SO2, then you can get into bound SO2. And those are good numbers uh, to have, especially like if your wine is two or three years old and you've made additions, you know, multiple months throughout the course of two to three years. And like, I might want to check my total SO2, you know, make sure it's not over 350 parts per million, which is the legal limit in the United States. So um, bound SO2 kind of comes after free SO2. So once you learn free SO2, you can then learn bound SO2. Good measurement to know. Um, one that's kind of a novelty, but still useful is paper chromatography for malolactic fermentation. Uh, that's like old school, just chemistry. It's, it, it's fun to do. It's not necessarily important. I mean, unless you just want to know precisely, has my wine gone through malolactic fermentation? And that just measures your, your progress of malic acid. If you have no malic acid and a lot of lactic acid, then yes, you've gone through malolactic fermentation. Um, it's, it's a good one to know. And then residual sugar, uh, not necessarily a, a uh, not a necessary test residual sugar, but still good to know, especially if it's like, oh, I think I detect a little bit of sweetness. These are, you know, if you're just, if you have a wine lab and just, I want to measure more and more and more, these are always good, good measurements to have. Again, more data is always good. So it never hurts to have too many numbers in my opinion. Um, and I think with that, yeah, that brings us to the end. So I just wanted to loop back around to the beginning, building a wine lab, start with a Venmetrica SC300. That is your going to be your most favorite piece of equipment. After that, just start accumulating various glassware. You know, you can buy a chemistry set, essentially. You can buy, you know, various, uh, an assorted glassware off Amazon for like $200. Just accumulate beakers and iPads and all that kind of stuff. Stands and clamps, because you have to have something to hold everything. Remember to set up near a functioning sink if you can. Have a source for a fire, scale, dishwasher, drying rag, paper towels, you know, squirt bottle with distilled water. So with that being said, that brings to the end. I'll pause the recording and take any questions. Uh, thank you.